I'm actually excited about this episode of the Elite Recruiter Podcast. I have my special guest, Adam Posner, who is the founder of the Podcast, which is actually one of the biggest recruit. He's actually, let me take a step back. He's one of the biggest recruiting podcasters out there and is impacted and helped a lot of people get into podcasting. So I have Adam on here to really talk about why podcasting could be, make such a huge impact for your recruitment business and your recruiting career. So welcome to the podcast, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin, Ben, what do you prefer? Let's get that out of the way. Hey, no, I, I answer to either, but the reason why I typically go by Benjamin is my last name is Mena. And you know, sometimes us recruiters ben are talking Mena. about that. Ben yeah. Mena, Ben Mena. Yep. yep. Benjamin, thank you. Benjamin, we'll go with Benjamin. And Benjamin, thank you so much for having me. That was a, that was a great intro. Um, it's, it's hard sometimes. I don't know if you get like, like I've been doing this for a long time and it's like, sometimes I don't feel like I've helped people, but lately I've been getting like a lot of emails and messages and kind words. And I'm like, all right, I guess, I guess I'm doing something right. And I wouldn't call that imposter syndrome more than like, I don't know. Do you have, do you have a problem? Like getting like positive feedback sometimes? I don't know. It feels weird, like undeserved. Uh, it, it is one of my limiting beliefs that I deal with constantly. Good. Like, so you're not alone with that. Good. We're getting it. I'm excited to be here, man. Let's rock and roll. I'm, <laughs> I am in the, today I'm in the passenger seat, which is hard as a podcaster. I'm going to go to the passenger seat. So I'm going to move over here. I'm going to go into the passenger seat. You got the keys. It's your car, man. Let's go for a ride. Well, Adam, before we do a deep dive in your background, like talk about your recruiting business and talk about your podcast. Yeah. So they, they kind of, they kind of go hand in hand where they, they, they feed each other. And I didn't know that was going to be the case in, until we got there, right? Like building this plane as we fly it. Um, my recruiting practice, I have two practices, NHP Talent Group and probably nothing talent wearing shirt here, actually rocking the brand. Um, NHP Talent Group, uh, well, long story short, got into recruiting about eight years ago, spent the first two and a half years working at search firms, learning the art and science of recruiting because I pivoted into it from working in the advertising industry. So I knew the industry I was recruiting for, but I didn't know how to be a recruiter. Right. Everyone thinks they could be a recruiter. Everyone thinks, oh, like a real estate agent. Oh, I, I bought a house once or I did construction. I could be a real estate agent. That's not how it works, Benjamin. You and I both know that. Um, so learn how to be a recruiter. Long story short, spent a couple of years learning the business. And then six, uh, six and a half years ago, I launched NHP Talent Group, which these are my daughter's initials right here, always above me. Nina Harrison Posner is before my son was born. He'll have a company <laughs> one day. But uh, yeah, looks over my shoulder all the time. Um, predominantly recruiting and marketing media, ad tech, martech. Uh, we do a mix of RPO and traditional contingency recruitment. The awesome. podcast, the podcast came about in February, 2019. Um, I grew up huge Howard Stern fan. Always, he, in my opinion, he's the best interviewer of all time. We're not talking about the dirty midget porn star kind of Howard Stern stuff. We're talking about the interviews, the long form the long form format of his interviews. And once he went from terrestrial radio to satellite radio, and he was able to just have infinity long conversations with folks, that was a game changer. And be able to say what you want and curse. And, and he turns an interview into a conversation. And that's, that's what I like to do. And, and I look at some of his interviews, for example, Hillary Clinton, um, two things about that interview. One, he prompted her to tell the love story of Bill and Hillary Clinton. Like, how did they meet? Like something you never heard before, like humanized her. And after he humanized her, he basically got her to say, if she came on the show during the election, maybe she would have swayed enough votes to change the results in the course of history. That's how powerful Crazy. it is. So anyway, um, I, I, and the other, the other great one that I love also is this Tom Brady conversation where he actually talks the same thing, similar, the love story of Tom and Giselle. Like how did that happen? Right? Like two powerhouses in their industry coming together. Um, so I was listening to shows back in 2019 and there wasn't really any great recruiting HR. They were very like clinical, like here's how you get a job. Here's the interview questions, right? I'm like, no, 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 we could do better than this. And I said, screw it. I'm just going to go for it. And I was working in a, share, in a co-working space in, in Long Beach, Long Island. And I reached out to one of my LinkedIn connections, Q. And I said, hey, dude, I'm, I'm giving this show a shot. Uh, do you want to do it? He's like, yeah, man. And I was in a little like glass box and I had the computer, a Yeti mic some old headphones in front of me and we just did it. And it was just a conversation. Awesome. My buddy is a DJ. He made a, uh, an intro track for me. There's a third version that I have on the show right now. And um, I figured it out. I figured out how to put these pieces together. I figured out how to do it all. And 
fast forward, you know, almost, you know, five years, 300 episodes, millions of downloads later, and, and it's, it's a beast, but they feed each other. They do. And we'll, we'll definitely like talk about that uh, shortly, but you're back, like, you didn't have the traditional approach to getting into the recruiting industry straight out of college, like most of us. Like you were in advertising, you were in media, you were in marketing, you worked for Gary V. Like, where did it come about and why did you even get into recruiting from the advertising space? Yeah, it's interesting too. So and I appreciate you doing your research. Yeah, it's first 15 years of my career working in Adland, account management strategy, big, small agencies, client side, American Express, Sirius XM, spent time there. So it's kind of a jack of all trades, right? Like I, I knew marketing from a lot of different angles, web one, like uh, when I was at Sirius, we were, I was the second person ever to have the Sirius XM app on their phone. It was actually a Blackberry because I was beta testing it for the tech team, right? Like fun fact. Um, but it wasn't until I went to go work for Gary Vee, which I thought was my dream job. I thought the grass was greener on the other side, Benjamin, but it wasn't. And I've told the story many a times, but it just, it wasn't the right time and place for me. That stage of my life, I was 35. I was kind of like at a point where I'm like, all right, well, making okay money. Like, what am I doing here? We just bought a house in the Burbs. And I, like, I just wasn't feeling it there. The culture wasn't right for me. And I ended up losing my job as the story goes. I got fired. And that day that I, that I got let go, I'm sitting there with Gary and he started to break down he said to me, he's like, you need to stop focusing on your weaknesses and double down on your strengths. And when you think about that, at this stage of your life, right? Like, I'm, I'm great at so many things. Why don't I double down and go big and all in on that versus trying to fix things that maybe I'm not so good at? And then you just, because if you do that, you're just in the middle. Then you're just going to be in the middle. And we're talking about my strengths, what I'm good at, what I'm, what I'm excelling at and, and all signs kind of point towards recruiting. And I, and I said to him, I'm like, well, you know, Gary, I got a friend who does healthcare recruiting and he kills it. He goes, dude, he goes, you would crush it in recruiting. And Benjamin, I thought he was just blowing smoke up my ass to get me out the door. Right. And pat on the ass. Hey buddy, go get him. You got this right. No, 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 no. So I was like, all right, this, this is kind of clicking in my head. All, all things are kind of like pointing. I'm like I, I, I've worked with a million recruiters. I've, I know kind of how it works a little bit, kind of like real estate agent thing I was going to before. And I also knew how much money my friends were making that were hustling. And the fact that I could move out of a, you know, mid hundred forty fifty thousand $50,000 job, getting incremental three, 4% raises a year and have unlimited earning potential really lit things up for me. But I didn't know how hard it was going to be, right? That's what we don't know, Benjamin. We don't know that the, a draw, we don't know commission structures. We don't really know like how the whole financial thing works until you get into it. So there I was out of work, April, May. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm just kind of sitting around. And there were some low points, man. There were some really, really low points. I would say it was the lowest points of my life where I was at rock bottom because I felt like I had no identity. I felt worthless. Luckily, my wife's an attorney. She does well. We were able, to, we, didn't, we didn't skip a beat as far as bills and stuff and everything. And I was lucky to have that because many people aren't. But I, I didn't know who I was. I was like, shit, I just failed. I can't go back to Adland. I can't go back and interview and have to tell a story why I was only in VaynerMedia for seven, eight months. Like, what happened, right? Like, that's a shitty story. Like, what are you going to do about that? And then I keep thinking, well, recruiting. I'm like, am I really going to start a new career? Like, it's mind-blowing. And I sucked it up, and I did it. And I went out and did my due diligence, and I met with every recruiter that I could get my hands on. And... I interviewed at places like Solomon Page and Robert Half, like these big kind of smile and dial. I'm like, I do not want that. I do not want that. I, I will lose my mind if I do that. And someone who, who tried to recruit me once, this guy, Fred Sill, he's like, hey, dude, I like you. Why don't you come have a chat with, with, with my boss, Tom, at Onward Search? And my first chat with Tom, I, I knew like him and I hit it off because, A, he was a Met fan like me, a, a sad Met fan like me. And B, he recognized that I wasn't going to be a smile and dial guy, but what I brought to the table was insane industry experience and a Rolodex like none other. And he taught me how to utilize that and build relationship-based business development versus cold calling and just straight MPC kind of uh, techniques, which is still important to use. And he nurtured me and he taught me the art and science of recruiting. And I thank him forever for that because I have a foundation that I have applied and I, I'm a good recruiter. I'm good at what I do. And the client side of it, I did that for 15, 16 years before I even got into recruiting. So I understand client management, how to manage expectations, right? Under promise, over deliver, over communicate, 
Those are fundamentals, and 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 that's my core, man. Thanks for letting me rant. <laughs> and, and there's a few things I want to like, dive into this. First of all, Gary V fired you, but he sat down and actually gave you good advice. Best advice I ever got. I I have, you know, I've been let go from places, and it was like, peace out the door. See you later. Here's later, your bro. email. Goodbye. Like, we never want to see you again. <laughs> Don't so, let the door hit your ass on the way out, right? <laughs> I, pretty much. And then secondly, like your entire identity was around the ad tech space and advertising space mm -hmm. and marketing space. How did you, during those low points, work on shifting that identity and not holding on to that to go make a complete career change? That was tough. And, and here, here was the toughest part. What do I tell my family and friends? That the, the, the career stuff I could, I could, I could figure out the optics around that. Like I could, I could figure out what that's going to look like, but how do I tell my family and friends the truth? How do I tell them? And at first it wasn't really the truth. It was kind of like, yeah, you know what? It didn't really work out. You know, I've been thinking about it a lot. I'm just going to change it. And then finally I was like, fuck it. Like, you know, people are going to know the real story anyway. Why don't I just own it? Own the story, own my failures. And that was my self-awareness epiphany, man. That, 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 that three or four month period. Um, and during that time also, and I, and I talked about it a couple of times, my, my daughter on her, on her third birthday had a terrible accident and, um, hot water, a, a cup of tea was spilled on her lap by accident. And we, she had third degree burns, had to get like skin graft. Like it was fucking terrible. And this was in the middle of me going through everything. And it was in the, it was a week before I was about to start recruiting. I already got the job. I already was gung ho head first into recruiting. I'm like, God, what are you? What are you doing to me? Like, how much more could I take right now? Right? Like I was mindset into starting a new job and, and like getting myself ready internally to be like, all right, I am starting at zero rookie, like training day, right? Like, like hard knocks, like first day on the field as a rookie, right? Like you're going to get smashed up and like scared that I have to learn a new career. You know what I mean? And like, and then this happens and I had to push through that and we got through and we moved through a couple of weeks and then, you know, my start date was delayed a couple of, couple of weeks, but then I did it and I jumped right in and I actually closed my first deal in a month. I, I had somebody who left and I kind of got a deal kind of handed to me like a quarter of the way there. I still had to bring it home and close the deal, but I did that. So I got my first role. It was kind of like a gift, right? I got the first deal into my belt, you know, but here's a crazy story. You're going to appreciate this and all the other recruiters out there. So. Everyone who's familiar, is your audience mostly recruiters? Mostly recruiters. All right, guys. So every, everyone understands the, the guarantee period, which I could go on a rant and saying it's the worst thing ever to happen in contingency recruiting because why are we responsible once that person gets hired? We didn't make that hiring decision. We're not onboarding them. We're not responsible for setting them up for success. Why are we responsible for that hire that we have to give money back or replacement if they get fired? Anyway, so this first candidate that I placed through the little gift that was given to me, got let go 88 days into a 90-day guarantee period for allegedly being high on drugs at work. The client would not tell me what drugs or any more detail than that. I was like, I don't believe you. I think that you're just using this as a free trial period. And that was my first like, oh, this is great recruiting. Now, welcome to recruiting, right? Did you talk to the candidate? What did the candidate say? He never responded to me. That was the other weird part. He, he, okay. so, I, so I kind of was like, this guy was probably fucked up on drugs or something. Like, maybe they're right, but that was a kick in the ass. Losing my first commission check. Yep. Mm -hmm. is, is it, was it one of those things where you, they already paid you and now they had to pull it back out of your account? Yep. Okay. Worst yeah, I think we ended up doing a replacement though, but like, it was okay. just a kick, a kick in the junk. Welcome to recruiting, buddy. And from like, you started that firm. When did you decide to actually jump out and go have your own search firm? Yeah. So a after Onward, I got, I got recruited to join a UK-based firm that was setting up shop here in the States and they were launching a digital practice. I got wine and dine, man. I got, I, part of me was like, I was kind of happy at Onward. I was doing well there, but I got wine and dine. I said, screw it. Let me just go for it. And I took this chance and it ended up being terrible, a terrible choice. These guys were... There was two firms. One of them was a digital firm that I was going to run. And the other one was a firm that handled management consulting roles. So these roles average salary were four or five, six hundred thousand dollars. These guys close two or three a year. 
they're murdering it from a fee perspective. So they were not supportive. They would roll into the office, you know, 11 a.m. the next day wearing the suits that they were wearing the day before. Infer what you want from that, right? Um, long story short, six, seven months in, I'm like, this is just terrible. My commission checks were getting strangely rooted through the UK and diluted and everything. I said, fuck this. You don't mess with somebody, somebody's money, especially a New Yorker, right? Like, that's not how it works. <laughs> and I was talking about this with my wife one day during lunch in, in, in Union Square Park. And she's like, why, why can't you just do this yourself? She's like, what are they giving you for half of your commission? What are they actually giving you? You're commuting every day to the city. You have a computer. You have your contacts. What are they giving you? LinkedIn access? Like, can't you figure that out and everything? I said, screw it. And that was it. And a week later, I launched NHP Talent Group and the rest is history. And that's yeah. how it works. If your wife didn't say that, and if your wife wasn't in your corner, would you have NHP Talent Group today? Probably not. Most likely not. And if she's listening to this, most definitely not. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, she's, she's, she's everything. She's, she's my force of nature. Yeah. Phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Now, when it, when it comes to podcasting, what is the impact on your recruiting business from having the podcast? Great question. So the, there's, there's two approaches to this. So, so we're going to talk client side and we're going to talk, um, candidates, right? So from a first and foremost, the podcast over the years has been able, has enabled me to create a brand that's backed on true social proof and credibility. It has given me a platform where I could share my thought leadership and industry experience and current clients and prospective clients could see that. Candidates see that too as credibility. And best of all, I get to feature guests on my show who are the experts and I shine a light on them and that light reflects back on me. So I put them center stage, I set the canvas for them and watch the magic happen. The other great part was organically, probably about 30, 40 episodes in, I started to book decision makers at companies that I wanted to do business with. And organically, I would follow up with them, build a relationship. Listen, having a guest on, first of all, people like to come on podcasts. They like that for their ego, right? Like they like that. Let's be real about that. So if you have somebody, instead of sending them 30 cold emails and phone calls, you book them on the show, you build a relationship with them. You do what we are doing right now, building a rapport, having a conversation. And a week later, you'd be like, hey, Benjamin, I see you have four open roles for open developer roles in your, com in your company. We, we, we do that. Can we help out? And they're like, yeah, Adam, Adam's a cool dude. Why don't you go talk to, to, to Meg in HR and we'll get you set up. Dude, for a two-year period, I was drilling that until the market crashed. And then the show evolved and I'd mix in some more lifestyle and cool story guests, but it's a great business development driver. Now, from the candidate perspective, they get hit up all the time, right? And they start to see me. And if they're on LinkedIn, they see me doing things. And like, oh, Adam, Adam, I see Adam all over my feed with his podcast and his other shit, right? Kind of knows what he's talking about, has good guests on, good looking set, has a nice, you know, short microphone here in the roadcaster. He's pretty legit, right? But that adds a credibility, right? That adds a social proof because you know what you're talking about and you bring on guests that are such a high caliber. Like, wow, Adam had X, Y, and Z on his show. Really? He must be doing something right. And I am because they're on my show, right? Like, it all, it all works I, out. I, on the candidate side, I think I had the funniest call uh, last week. I called up a developer, TSSCI security clearance, and I started having a conversation and the guy was just like, your voice sounds so familiar. Hmm. And I'm like, okay. I mean, it's the cleared world. I've probably had conversations with him multiple times over the last like 15 plus years. Right. And he's like, do you have a podcast? And I'm like, yes. Yeah. He's like, are you the elite recruiter podcast? And I'm like, and he's like, oh yeah, I've had my recruiting friends like send that to me. And I'm like, you're a developer. <laughs> so great. you just never know. You never, you never, you never know. I mean, that's and, the magic. It opens up so many opportunities. It's opened up speaking gigs for me. It's opened up, I've, I've done a bunch of, of, of uh, I've moderated a bunch of panels all across the U.S. globally. I, I spoke in London last summer. I'm speaking in Germany in October. Like that wouldn't happen without a podcast. It adds a brand to the recruiting. Now, is it for every recruiter out there? Absolutely not. A podcast is not for everybody. You and I both know how hard this is, the consistency, the work that goes into it. And some people, you're not meant for it. It takes a certain something. So I want to dig into sure. two things that you said. One more time, go over like the BD strategy that you yep. use to crush it. 
with having the podcast. It's very simple. I'm going to synthesize it. Instead of cold calling and cold emailing decision makers at companies, you invite them onto your show. You book them. You have the interview. You do all your prep. You have those questions set. Another part about the questions in there, I would like to ask them hiring questions. I'm like, so, so Benjamin, all right, you're, you're, I got you on the show right now and I got to ask you, what is your secret interview question? How does Benjamin Mena, how, how, how do you really, listen, by the time someone gets to you, Ben, right, they already have the skill set, they're, they're qualified for the job, but they're meeting you so you can understand their personality, their values, their character. How do you do that in a 30, 45 minute conversation? Right, so now, now you're showing your prowess as a recruiter. So you kind of like backdooring that shit right in there, right? You have a great conversation with them. You build a good rapport. You send your thank you email. You wait a week. You see their open jobs and then you hit them up. So you're not asking for anything. You're not even like, a lot of my guests don't even know I'm a recruiter until I tell them. That, <laughs> but that's a good thing because then they're not, they don't have that, that bias in their head. Like, shit, Adam only wants me on the show because he's trying to close me with a client. And I don't reach out to every guest like that, right? It's got it's to feel right. But when it does, it's a slam dunk. I'm telling you, it's a slam dunk. And but, then, but, but, but you can only do that if you have a good podcast, right? Like it's, yeah. you, got, you got to build a good show. And it's, it's something like I've told multiple people over the years. I was just like, you know, I we had a podcast in the Web3 space. And I think it was about episode three or four. I somehow was already an authority in the space. People were reaching out to me, hiring managers. And yeah. during the interview, like, I would just be like, you know, some of the questions, like, like Adam said, it was like, you know, where do you find your top talent? Like, you mm -hmm. know, the, my, the quick fire questions that I have for this podcast, I had some of those were, were like evolved around recruiting. So they're literally like also giving your secrets. You develop the relationship mm -hmm. and then you can go work with them to get stuff filled. So exactly. love that. It's a Trojan, Secondly, it's a Trojan horse. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it, it really is like the secret weapon of 2023, in my personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Now you've, the podcast has also opened some doors into you doing speaking gigs, uh, you know, for Web3, recruiting. You know, I think you're a keynote speaker at an upcoming, like, Web3 event. Yeah, in Berlin. Because of the podcast. Mm -hmm. talk, talk about that. It, it's, it's, it goes back to credibility, and it goes back to setting the stage. And, and you look at, like, uh, the coverage I, di I did for VCon the last few years. I'm literally interviewing the best folks in Web3. Uh, Friday, this Friday, Jesse Pollock, the founder of Base at Coinbase, is coming out tomorrow. Um, this dude is tops in the industry you know i'm interviewing you know sarah buxton from gala games like these are the top in the industry so it gives you the credibility where an event looking for speakers and they're looking for also moderators that's my other trojan horse a much i love moderating much more than keynoting i've done a keynotes is not natural for me right but moderating is basically live podcasting on stage i mean it's it's plug and play it's my wheelhouse and they're like, wow, Adam has an, a great ability to interview and ask questions on the fly. We have great Web3 guests out there. We need somebody who could do this and really elevate that experience for the audience and create content around it. So it's just opened up, it's opened up so many doors. I mean, it just works. It's credibility, validation, skillability, right? Because a, a lot of conferences, they, they kind of get suckered into speakers and moderators who are sponsors, right? It's kind of like a pay to play yep. kind of thing. And that's shitty. Yep. That doesn't make for a good conference. But the conferences have to find the balance between the two and to make that work. And those are the smart ones. So, and I, you jumped in VCon. I was, that was going to mm -hmm. be another question. I was like, oh man, you, you were everywhere for VCon. And one of the things that I love about like you being at VCon is also that's turned into like months of, temp of, of content for you. Dude, it was, it was 30 hours of raw content that Chris and I shot, my, my producer. And it was a mix of three, three days, three full days of him following me and doing man on the street interviews, random, random people interviews, and then set interviews that were scheduled during the event too. And I was lucky enough because I have access. I had a media lounge. I had a, I had a proper studio set up and it was great, but it was exhausting. It was absolutely like I came back from VCon. I was shot for a week, but it was worth it. So out of that, we got three daily vlogs, audio, video for each day, separated that, six sit-down interviews, proper six-down interviews, and then so much micro content that I still have it and have it scheduled through the end of Q3. And I loop it back to the shows that we already did because it's such good content. It's like off the cuff, improv, hot takes about the industry, Web3, Gary V, like all stuff that kind of resonates. But it's that human story, right? Like, and that was the biggest part about VCon is like, 
what brought you here? What are you learning from it? Like, and then you start to put the pieces in your head. Like it's insane what Gary Vee's building, right? He's building a real, they, people connect to V friends and what it's all about. This is the next Disney Sesame, whatever you want to call it, man. But it's, it's awesome to watch. And, uh, I'm lucky that I get to document it and, um, looking forward to going back next year. And each year I elevate the experience. Year one, it was just me with the microphone and it was kind of tough. It was my first kind of live event. And this year I said, screw it, brought my video guy with me and we crushed it. And next year I know all the lessons learned from this year, first year with video, how to do it better, how to pre-schedule a little bit more things, how to like not run around as much, maybe stay stationary. But I also like running around. Like that's an adrenaline rush, man. Like if you watch, if you watch these videos, you literally see me running around Lucas Oil Field, a giant, you know, 80,000 person football stadium. I think I did like a million steps in three days. I looked at my, my Apple watch. I was like, shit. One point, it's like, you're having a heart attack, man. Like, slow down. Like, it gave me the heart attack warning. But, uh, yeah, that was a good time. That's, yeah, I, I love watching the content on, on uh, LinkedIn. So, yeah, definitely follow Adam on LinkedIn to catch some of the things that he's doing. Now, when it comes to actually building a podcast, I'd love for you to kind of cover, like, lessons learned or what you would advice you would give to somebody that's looking at starting one. And like tools, tips, tricks, all that yeah. kind of stuff. All right. So a, a couple things here. And I, and, I, and I like talking about this because I haven't in a while. First and foremost, a podcast is not for everybody. You have to want to do it. If you're working at a company and like that marketing guy's like, oh, we need a podcast, right? Because everyone's doing that. No, no, we want you to do it, Ben, because I think you have a cool radio voice. You have to want to do it. Because if you don't want to do it, it comes out in the audio. The audience doesn't feel it. And the show is not going anywhere. You have to feel the motivation in the host's voice. Now. Out of the gate, was I like this? Was I, was I polished? Was I able to do this? No, I was rough around the edges. And that took a lot of work. And the, the biggest aha moment came to me about 18, 20 episodes in where somebody I trust said to me, he's like, Adam, like, you're, you're doing a good job. But I got to tell you something. You're not listening to your guests. You are thinking about the next question before they get to answer it. So you're doing two things. You're jumping over them. You're cutting them off. You're not letting them answer. And you're also not giving enough space to listen and maybe take a left turn, a right turn, a U-turn and dig deep into those questions because those are the conversations that people want to hear. They want to go deeper. They want that follow-up question. And that was a game changer for me. So for my show, we do a ton of prep. We have a ton of prep. Chris and I work really hard. He's amazing. He's got my tone. He's got my voice. He's got the flow. So I have an outline of where I want to go and a story arc, but I also have the ability to, to veer off the road and, and, and take a shortcut and maybe come back and get back on the highway. And, that, and, that, and that's key. So that, that's number one. Listen, listen more than you talk. And that's why when I get to be on a, on a show like yours, I, could, I get to talk. And I love it because I can finally talk about what I want to talk about instead of just pushing the sh my show along. Um, but remember, you're telling the story and the audience has to feel it. Always keep your audience top of mind. They are the ones listening to it. Think about their audio experience, right? Think about, are they enjoying it? Are they getting into it? Could they get behind this? That's critical. Second part is you and I both know there's something called pod fade. I think the stat is most shows don't make it past six or seven episodes because people don't realize how much work it takes. So it comes down to process, batch production, and outsourcing. I'll record, for example, in, 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 in uh, June and July, I recorded probably about 12, 13 episodes. That enabled me to take five weeks off in the summer where I could just chill and not do anything. And I already have shows that are already recorded through end of September. Now, you got to be careful with that because you don't want shows to go stale. And most of my content's evergreen, but you got to be kind of mindful of that. And also, the guest is like, you send them the email that the show is live. And then, like, they're like, did we record this in April? <laughs> right? Like, shit. Like, you got to, you got to, you got to, um, you, you got to. <laughs> You got to, you know, be, be, be mindful of that for sure. But it's hard, man. And you got to be consistent and you got to always improve and up your game and put the time and effort in because it shows. Now, if there's somebody thinking about doing a podcast, is there like a goal number that you would say like, like to get to? Ten. Is that we were going back and forth. That's on a LinkedIn post yesterday. And I said 50, but first is 10. If you can make it to 10 episodes, people don't realize how hard it is. We did our, our Web3 show, Mutable Mindcast. We made it up to 25 and we had to shut the doors on that for various reasons, but that was hard too. And I thought it'd be easy for me to get there because I'm almost at 300 in five years. And I realized by starting a new show, how hard is And now we're working on a third show coming out with one of our sponsors called Got Fired. And 
we're struggling just to get shows recorded and coordinated and figure it out and everything. And like, you don't realize until you start a show from scratch how hard it is. So challenge yourself, set, set, set realistic goals, get to 10, then put your eyes out there to 25. Like Jordan Parrish said to me when I was at 16 shows, he said, push yourself to 50. And that number was important because that's a year's worth of weekly shows. Committed to a year of fucking shows, man. And we did it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I, I think, think it's like one of the things, like going back to Gary V. I don't remember if it was like in a video or if it was something. He, like, he was talking about like making content and I just put on my podcast hat. And I was like, you know, he, he's like, if you get to 100 and you're the only person listening and you've gotten some out, something out of it, it's still a win. Mm -hmm. And yeah. You know, well, I guess a no. Yeah. At least for, like, a lot that of effort was my, for that, one person. <laughs> yeah. A lot of effort, you know, luckily like, you know, there are some phenomenal listeners and thank you guys for listening. But yeah, it was just like, you know, it was like, Hey, it takes work. A lot it, of work. And, it, and luckily, like, you know, I know you have a team. Um, I know like I'm a single person podcaster kind of doing everything myself. And I use a lot of like now AI tools that. Yeah. Let's talk there. about that. Yeah. They didn't have those when I was uh, now with Riverside right now, the platform we're using right now. I mean, I have a team that is amazing. I figured out outsourcing and, and here's the way I do it. Anything that somebody else could do better, faster, cheaper, and more efficient than me that I don't have to learn audio editing, video production, anything, I'm going to outsource it. So I could focus on my core business. Now, that's my philosophy. Now, that's not realistic for a lot of people and people want to learn it. You have tools in front of you like Riverside right now. At the end of this episode, within minutes, you're going to have the ability to have AI generated clips. And I did this yesterday with a show because I wanted to get a message out for a show. I recorded that day that's not coming out for five weeks. I banged that shit out in two seconds. It'll give you the transcript. You'll be able to download individual files. You could literally, in the platform, edit it, audio, video. If you have your, your, your intro sound, you could literally plug and play it in and your episode's done. We didn't have that five years ago. If I, I had mean, this now, maybe I would have just kept it myself. <laughs> I mean, I, like, I started out on Zoom. Like I tell people if you're getting started, like, Riverside is the best. I started out with Zoom. There's things you could do. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Descript at all. Yep. So I, I actually personally use Descript. You know, what it, what Descript does is it literally transcribes it like a Word document and it gives you, you can literally edit a video or edit an audio like you're like editing a Word document. Mm -hmm. So it's the way that I get rid of all my ums and the you knows that I say constantly. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's a bunch of the different AI video tools, like, you know, now that Riverside has that, that can just easily cut clips. You know, I do outsource the video side for the clips because I realized back before Riverside's magic clips, I was probably spending five to 10 hours a week just doing that. And that was just, my focus was recruiting. Time suck, man. <laughs> so like, I, you know, I, I, I personally outsource the clip making, but outside that, like the recording the editing Pro. can literally be done within about two to three yeah. hours a week. Check out, check out Opus Pro. Um, game changer on that. Check out Opus Pro. The, the, the AI technology, what's crazy about that, and, and I, am, I would love for them to be a sponsor, um, it uses AI scoring, right? So they are pulling the clips through the transcript and they're scoring what would be the most impactful clip based on virality, whatever their algorithm is. And it spits that clip out with captions and everything done for you. And then you could set the parameters too, but I want 60 second clips max, 90 second clips max, depending on what you're using it for. Dude, it's game changing the technology that's out there. It makes it so easy for us to put content out. You're stupid it not is, to. It is, I like, you know, we're 90 something episodes in. I think by the time this one goes live, it'll be over a hundred. I'm like, I wish all those tools were there when I first started. Mm. <laughs> well, Adam, is there anything else that you'd love to share about your background or podcasting before we jump over the next part of the episode? Um, yeah, man, I mean, definitely check out my podcast, the podcast. And, uh, I, I also, uh, put all my thoughts. I distilled my years of podcasting into a little thing I called the pause course, pause course.com. You could check that out. And, uh, I'm not going to teach you how to set up your microphones or optimize your audio video, but I'm going to teach you what we're talked about today about how to, how to utilize a podcast for B2B business and my, my method and approach and mindset strategy tactics. And I'll have that for in the show Thank notes. You. So appreciate that. The link will be there. Man, I think it's like 150 to 200 pages of just you dumping your knowledge about podcasting into that, right? I don't know if it's 200 pages. I think I think it's I, know, I think it's a little bit less than that, but it's it's a it's a it's a playbook. And okay. I literally outline like I'm I'm handing you you know the playbook on on how to do it. Now it's up to you to, to do it. Like soup to nuts. Here's how you do it, man. Here's how you go about it. 
here's a mindset. Here's how to approach it from a business development standpoint here that the email templates to book guests to, to follow up with them. Like, here you go. Now do what you want with it. Phenomenal. Well, Adam, ready? Are you ready for the quick fire question? Let's go. So what advice would you give to a recruiter that's just getting started in 2023 in the recruiting industry? Every day you wake up in the morning and you probably ask this question later, but plan your work and work your plan. Start your day with a plan. This is what I'm going for. This is what I'm focused. And you have to have volume and activity. Volume and activity will drive action. Same question, but what advice would you give to a recruiter that's been around the block for a long time? Take a moment to step back and, and reevaluate what's working, what's not, and be open to change and feedback. Don't be stuck in your ways if something's not working. Do you have a favorite recruiting rec tech tool that you absolutely love? Um, yeah, I use, and they're, cause they're sponsoring my show. I use Interseller. Interseller is a CRM tool, it scrapes email addresses, puts them into a CRM. And has there been a book that has had a huge impact on your own personal career? Yeah, absolutely. I just finished reading. It's called Burn the Boats by Matt Higgins. Matt Higgins is Gary Vee's partner at VaynerMedia. Uh, if you think about the concept of burn the boats, it's literally to not have a plan B and put all your effort into plan A. Check awesome. it out. 100, 100 million percent recommend it. Game changer. Okay. I'll, I'll Matt Higgins, burn out. the boats. Link it up. What's your thoughts on the future of recruitment with artificial intelligence? This is an interesting one. Um, I am all for using AI that'll make our jobs faster and more efficient so we could put more effort and time into the human elements of recruiting, which are the conversations. Understanding someone's why, understanding someone's motivation. You still have to have that human connection as a recruiter. There are many elements that can be automated from email, outreach. Um, I've even seen great tools that have a lot of initial conversations, for example, tech roles, to qualify them. Do you have this experience? Do you have TSI poly clearance? Do you have like all these things that you need before we even get to the conversation? But if you frame it the right way, and very upfront, be like, we're asking you these qualifying questions because we want to be mindful of your time. Once we get these out of the way, the recruiter will be able to use that time instead of going through those qualifications to talk to you as a human and find out what you're looking for and answer questions. That's how I approach it. Not so rapid awesome. fire, but my, my thoughts. <laughs> and, you know, even though they are quick fire questions, they don't have to be like super quick answers. So, but yeah, I absolutely love that. You know, when it comes to your own personal success, what do you think has been a big driver of that? I think, I think it's, it's self-awareness and I think it's the ability to know what's not working, what is working, listen to feedback, be open to feedback and, um, just have a general sense of kind of where you are and where you stand in, in, in the market. Okay. Now, and this is actually my favorite question I love asking everybody, everything that you've learned, the ups and downs, the successes, the failures, if you could literally sit down and have a cup of coffee with yourself. At the Jeez. very beginning of your career, what advice would you actually give yourself? I would say trust your gut more. Stop. Be more on the offense than the defense. And double down on relationships even more than I'm doing now. Awesome. Well, Adam, I just want to say thank you so much for being a guest on the Recruiter Podcast. Um, Make sure to go check out the podcast, millions of downloads, tons of stories about recruiting, tons of stories outside of recruiting. And he's done such a good job. If you're looking at starting a podcast, like he does such a good job interviewing the guests, asking questions, doing a deep dive, a bit of a rewind. And there are so many lessons that you can learn for when you do your own podcast. So definitely, Adam, thank you. And before I let thank you me. go. Is there anything else that you would love to share with the listeners? Yeah. I mean, you could, you could please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I, I enjoy having conversations. I'm really trying to focus a lot more on, on the, on the comments than just the posts. Uh, check out more at the podcast.com and uh, check out the pause course and uh, just happy to connect. And, and Benjamin, uh, kudos to you, man. You're, you're a great host. You got something good here. I could see it and hear it and feel it in your voice that like, this is something that you want to do. You put out a good show. People get value from it. And I truly believe in the abundancy model mindset, right? Like I truly believe in that, that the, there's enough for everybody, even when it comes to recruiting, right? Like we're all competing somehow with each other. Let's call it what it is, right? So, so let's just all play nice in the sandbox and, and just be nice to each other. Just be kind. Absolutely. Well, Adam, once again, thank you so much. For the listeners, keep crushing it. Thanks, man.